Hello and welcome to the first edition of Mjolnir at the Movies Now Showing. Uh, this is a new format and because one of us can't join us uh, this uh, week, uh, namely Neil, uh, sadly due to a death of uh, one of the members of his family and he's got to go to the funeral, um, but he'll be back in any case for the regular format. So uh, what we thought we would do whenever there's just a couple of us here is to do this Now Showing podcast. And this is just a little look at what's happening at the moment in the film and entertainment industry. And some of the films that have recently been released, some that have yet to come, and some of the ones that are in the cinema at the moment. So, hence, now showing. And I'll start with some of the ones that have just been and gone. Uh, so we've had this biography of J.R.R. Tolkien, which I thought was interesting. I don't know if you got to see anything of that, did you, James? Well, I've not got around to it, but I knew it was going to be interesting. Well, it was it was interesting in one way, uh, but the film itself was terribly dull, actually. Um, there wasn't hmm. that much propaganda in it, because it's a Disney film, obviously, um, and I expected a lot more propaganda, but there wasn't that much, actually. So, uh, pleasant surprise. Yeah, pleasant surprise. There we go. Um, they did sort of have a little pop at uh, one of Tolkien's friends and suggested that he might have been homosexual. You know, they were getting that in implicitly, uh, which was Geoffrey Bachsmith, the poet. Incidentally, I do recommend the poetry of Geoffrey Bachsmith, and there was certainly no evidence to him having been homosexual, unlike they tried to portray him in this film. They've mm. uh, portrayed this relationship between him and his mother as the domineering mother like uh, Ian Forster had, for example, and that he was, as a result, some kind of homosexual who was secretly in love with J.R. Tolkien. And mm. there's no evidence for that. And, uh, as I say, this is pretty egregious of Disney to portray him in that way, but that's Disney. It was so they did make Black Hole, so that was one thing. Yeah, but that was when it was more proper Disney than it is now, isn't it? So it's, things have changed since then, and we've, we've got Disney Wars now. Oh, dear. <laughs> uh, yeah, in, in fact, that's going to be something that's upcoming. It's the last, hopefully it's the last anyway, uh, Star Wars uh -huh. film. Yeah. I hope that there's never another Star Wars film ever again. There only was three. There only was three, that's right. It was the first three and of those the first and the one... first film is just called star wars that's all it's called it's just called star wars that's right get gotta get the name right yeah nothing to do with hope <laughs> <laughs> or hate, or hate that's right. <laughs> i'll set him up you knock him in <laughs> yeah so uh tolkien it also got the feminist slant in a bit there so you had uh, tolkien's wife uh, well wife to be i should say uh, who was seen as a feminist icon and uh, someone who was oppressed by society because of women always oppressed by society back then when in fact um, she had uh, quite a license to do what she wanted really and she a chose lot. she chose to convert to Catholicism to suit uh, Tolkien so I imagine a lot above a certain class would have enough free time to have tremendous freedom for their own interests. Well, a absolutely. You look at um, a lot of the early feminists, uh, and they come, they're women who come from bourgeois backgrounds. And mm. so they had a lot of freedom, but they were bored with it. <laughs> it's uh, the, the main yeah. thing. It's hard to claim to be especially pressed when you've essentially got all the time in the world to read anything you like, write anything you like, see anything you like. Yeah, uh, I mean, a good uh, example is the Bronte sisters. And uh, Charlotte Bronte, she uh, claimed this story of oppression and everything, that she was in this patriarchal society and everything. If you've read Elizabeth Gaskell's biography of her, because uh, Elizabeth Gaskell was friends with the Brontes, and she asked Charlotte Bronte basically what her childhood was like, and she uh, gave this story of oppression and so on, where you actually find out that her father had supported her writing right from the beginning and helped mm -hmm. her to get published. So that's um, well, they they, the they with... invent the impression uh, the oppression. Yeah, uh, this is the trouble with, with the history we've got. Is 
maybe you can probably dig in to get the absolute raw facts, but the history is never presented that way to the mainstream. It's presented in film and in song and in TV and various snippets that are all dressed up with layer upon layer of fiction and emotion. Like, for instance, you talk about the Great Oppression when the, they were jumping under horses, remember? Yeah, Except, abs- absolutely, yeah. You look at the t- that time when they were claiming a special uh, oppression, the vast majority of men didn't have the vote. Uh, that's right. So the, the, the whole of the male working class did not have the right to vote. Yeah. Uh, so you were talking about maybe 15% of men had the vote, and that was it. So... Because by a, just before the war, the First World War, it was about eighteen percent. So you know, right, would have been about that. Because so after it wasn't until after the First World War that there was any stretching of the franchise out to other bands, and 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 it was all, even after the working class got it, it was only a few, a couple. I think it was two Parliament sessions that women got it too. So yeah. th- there's this massive farce claim of eternal oppression when the vast majority of men had no franchise, no in this great democracy that's supposed to have been about for that long. And in actual fact, and that even close to the form we have now, only existed just prior to World War II. Yeah, you see... So there's I... actually people alive right now older than the democracy we have. That's actually worse people realise when they think it's some eternal thing going back to the dawn of time. There's people alive now older than democracy in this country. Yeah, you see, I look at it the other way around in that I think that by the time it had reached 15%, it had already gone too far with the uh, suffrage. Mm, Well, the question, of course, is uh, does everybody think that everybody around them should run their life as much as themselves (laughs) would be the question, wouldn't it? I mean, everybody knows quite possibly they have that opinion of us. Do they think that we should be running their life? I'd imagine there'd be people that disagree, disagree with us would say, hell no. So, do they want us to vote in their life? Probably not. Mm, um, well, what I mean is is basically that uh, I, I, I think that there was too much suffrage by the time we got to 15%. I, you know, I have a very aristocratic look at things, and uh, I think uh, the problem Plus, was... Mean it, it should yeah. be that- Everybody knows in their own life that the best qualified person is themselves, obviously, but th- that instills the idea that there is such a thing as the best qualified person to make a decision. Not uh, everybody is equally qualified to make a decision, which is what the idea of universal suffrage is. Yeah, well, I put it this way, in that basically, uh, if you want a doctor, you want a qualified doctor, don't you? you, you mm. you're, not, you're not going to go for an operation and go to just anybody you want someone qualified to know what he's doing and it's the same with the body body politic if you like that yeah you would you wouldn't go up down your street asking a hundred neighbors what what you should do about your cancer or heart condition <laughs> that's right yeah <laughs> and why, why should the local drug dealer have the same vote and right as uh, someone who's very intelligent and knows what he's doing <laughs> so and there's also the, nonsense. There's also the the issue where if somebody's going to decide things, I hope that he's a lot smarter than me. Because if if everybody's getting the chance, I think, well, why wouldn't I just maybe the one make the decisions, <laughs> which I don't want to be. I want whoever it is to be vastly more wise and intelligent than me, so I can be rest assured that things are getting done properly. Yeah, as I say, going back to the film. Tolkien's wife was obviously an extremely intelligent woman, which is why he went out with her in the first place. Uh, mm. Because he obviously respected that intelligence. And, and she had a profound effect on him because, of course, he the whole uh, story of Beren and Luthien, for example, uh, in uh, well, in the Silmarillion is based on their courtship and, uh, you know, and, and love. And she put, you know, he puts her on a pedestal. So uh, this idea that... Uh, men were somehow oppressive to towards women is completely false uh, in in the west um, generally speaking we've always had quite a respectful attitude towards our women uh, mm. i i think that the adoption of christianity was certainly a problem for women that is true because it negated the feminine divine i've mentioned this in programs before and this i would take issue with about 
Tolkien's Catholicism, because I think that Roman Catholicism absolutely ruins women, uh, uh, as does uh, Christianity in general. Uh, but, There's but a few more subs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's right. Um, but Tolkien lent very much towards paganism, and certainly mm. his friend Geoffrey Bark Smith did. If you read his poems, and he talks about really the nonsense of sin, mm. and and that that's very true. I, th I think that sin is uh, this idea of sin is utterly nonsensical, and you know where you're born into basically having done something wrong, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is preposterous when you think a newborn yeah. baby, and yet you've done something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> complete complete garbage but mm. um but tolkien was very much influenced by the pagan world just as he was by the christian world and so well, there, were, there is a certain type of catholic that seems to flirt with that sort of pagan world well there is quite a bit of paganism in catholicism less so mm. now since vatican ii when it's gone more towards protestantism but back then, when Pro when Tolkien was around, there was certainly a lot more pagan ideas and uh, and uh, pagan a pagan way of seeing the world in Roman Catholicism. Mm. Certainly, there wouldn't would have been very little of this turning the other cheek and so on. Which, of course, when you look at uh, Tolkien as the warrior who fought in the First World War, you very much see that uh, because yeah. because. Christianity does not have a warrior ethic at all. It does not have an idea of the pagan heroic. But Roman Catholicism does, but it's, it doesn't come from Christianity, that. It comes from the world before Christianity, from Rome, from pre-Christian Rome. Uh, and I suppose what happened there is because the Christian element never had that... It, what filled that void was the native European aspect so that just sort of filled in that gap in the wall yeah well when you read uh, Tolkien uh, <laughs> I mean I if you read Tolkien a lot of it is idolatrous let's be honest because <laughs> 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 you, you, you have Gandalf as a Jesus figure who is also Odin uh, we, we ought to do a podcast on Lord of the Rings actually uh, itself so um, we'll, uh, we'll not come on to Lord of the Rings we'll, we'll, we'll stick with Tolkien yeah, I, th I thought that just... yeah and, and then get on to other stuff. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting about the film and should have been explored more, that there was the cuts from the First World War to his earlier life at uh, Oxford and so on. And I thought that that was a good idea and it wasn't done often enough. You didn't have enough of the First World War, frankly, to make the film interesting. And yeah, that would have been a, a good way to get a bit of action and drama and horror for folk people to <laughs> keep them engaged in their seat. And also it's important to explain that because to most people these days that kind of horror and war is completely alien and hard to understand. Especially as in that film it's important to show it because you're not showing it as a war film you're showing it to inform people that these are ordinary people living their lives with that in their background, that in their history. This is what's shaped them. Well, for most people, that's not something that will ever shape them. That's right, and certainly Tolkien pretty much began his whole Middle Earth stuff in the trenches to keep his mind off the wall and to have some kind of fantasy escapism. And mm. that wasn't fully explored enough, I, th I think. Uh, and there should have been that's a big flaw. Yeah. yeah, should have been more scenes in the trenches. I thought that what was good though is that there were cuts to a fantasy element and and that also wasn't done enough so for example when there's this mm. explosion you know you, you get the big uh, ball of fire going up going up and you have sort of morgoth in the middle of it that was really well oh. done also when the germans have the flamethrower and they're uh, you know doing doing the fire in the trenches and everything and suddenly it cuts to a dragon uh, you know, fire and ah. flame out. That, that was really well done. That is very clever. Yeah, very clever. And I thought it was really good, but not done often enough. That was the And also problem. keep people engaged. Yeah, that could really keep people engaged with an otherwise dry story. Yeah, because the, the problem is that a lot of it... Was and it's justified, just of course, dry. to... Yeah, because it's justified to explain 
his inspiration for writing now. It's a great, it's a great idea. I never realised I had that. Mm. So yeah, so there were some good ideas, but they weren't fully explored, and it didn't make a profit at the box office. Mm. Uh, it's a rare case where somebody's come up with a really good gimmick, uh, not to belittle it, use that term, but a good gimmick, but then underused it for once because normally when somebody comes up with a new or clever idea they overuse it and it ruins a film yeah but there's been some really dull biographies they seem to be making them to a formula these days uh, mm. like they do most films and uh, I, I, I watched that Mr. Turner for example uh, that Lee film um, who uh, I've, I've forgotten the name of the chap who he was on in our feeder zone pet he played Barry uh, he was the guy who played uh, J.M.W. Turner, you know, the artist. And, oh. and and Turner had a very interesting life. Unfortunately, they made it into a really boring life. <laughs> 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 he, was that's, he was literally that's like... That's quite an accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> he was literally... Normally they try to, to make boring things interesting, but it tastes all really good and make that, it boring. That's, that's right. Well, it was like watching a Turner painting for two hours. <laughs> oh dear but it has a certain formulaic uh, narrative and they were guilty of that too often in this Tolkien film was uh, the music generic or was it yeah good? Music, music's ge pretty generic uh, apart, Out there. apart from when yeah. they, threw, they threw a bit of Wagner in there which was good because uh, Tolkien's wife to be was a fan of Wagner um, but Catalog stuff and off the shelf, basically for the rest. Yeah, there, there, there just wasn't enough to it to keep you engrossed for long enough. Uh, which it sounds almost like the the vision for it could have been good, but then it was compromised just by the structure of Hollywood because they would want it to fit what they believe a biography should be. It should have this type of music, this type of story structure, these types of shots and elements. There probably is that sort of pressure to conform. Yeah, and, and just they, to get the money. Yeah, they tried to stick to the elements that conformed to the political narrative that they have obviously mm. so they put Joseph Wright in there Joseph Wright writes a bit of a hero of mine uh, who uh, you know is a, is a master of languages and so on he taught at Oxford University taught Tolkien and uh, spoke several languages also he, he was a Yorkshireman and um, I've got his uh, dialect <laughs> dictionary um, oh. which, uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, he, he founded the Yorkshire Dialect Society. Uh, I hope uh, you've not got a poster him in the wall. <laughs> no, no, I haven't got a poster in the wall. But he, he had an interesting life himself as well, but uh, he certainly wasn't a, a liberal and he certainly criticised the university system as, as being bourgeois and interested only in money. Mm. Um, and... Uh, Obviously, they portrayed him as a working class guy because they like that sort of thing. If they can't get a black, they'll try to push in a working class guy who's fighting against the system and so on. Well, oh. he, um, Joseph Wright wasn't about that at all, really. He, he was a self made man. He came from the working classes. Literally, he was illiterate until he was 15. And he, he, he was self taught and, and, and then went on to teach others and so on. That's uh, been that age. Yeah, and he he saved his money up so that he could afford a, uh, afford a semester at Heidelberg University because um, he'd studied German and went there and um, wrote about the connections between the German and English languages, particularly uh, dialects and so on, uh, and the Germanic influences in dialects. And he actually, to save money, he, he walked all the way from... Uh, I think it was somewhere in was it somewhere in Belgium or or, or, or was it Amsterdam or somewhere uh, or was it Antwerp? Can't remember. But anyway, um, sort of somewhere in the uh, lowlands there uh, to save money. <laughs> he, he walked it to uh, to Heidelberg, and, and 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 he was he was completely uninterested in money because they offered him uh, stipendiums, uh, bursaries, you, you know, to do. Um, the work that they wanted him to do at Oxford University and everything, he turned it down to do the work <laughs> that he wanted to do. So this is, this is the kind of stubborn sort of Yorkshireman that he was. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, and, and so, so admirable. Yeah, 
absolutely. Um, certainly non-conformist, but non-conformist in a way that wouldn't be quite the way that they that Disney would want him to be. He certainly mm. didn't believe in uh, suffrage for women, for example. Mm. That's <laughs> no, that's not <laughs> that's not controversy. At, yeah, that's right. That's not looked at. Um, but and anyway, um, so so they they brought him in, um, but again they didn't explore that relationship between Wright and Tolkien. It was sort of bitting and batting quite a lot in different bits of his life, but not really putting things together as a whole. And, and that was also quite disappointing about the film. Sort of felt like you were getting a sprinkling of on this date he did this, but you're not getting a a narrative in the sort of reasons put together it doesn't flow properly that, that's right although you did get a sort of narrative in the love story which was cobbled together really because it's not what it what happened in his real life actually they tried to mm. make a t typical hollywood love story out of it but anyway it's an um, even more it's even more of a shame when they have got the real story written out I mean, it's one thing you can't uh, look back at some of these very ancient characters and know exactly what happened but when you've got a more recent character and you've got a very good account of their history not to take advantage of it well the thing is that Tolkien led an extraordinary life and yet they've made it into something incredibly dull mm. with and you know with the exception for maybe half an hour of the film mm. and they obviously had the they'd, well, for cinematic purposes the advantage of the first world war situation where they could have had tremendous run with it as they did as you've pointed out as they did at some parts hmm. such that's a wasted opportunity yeah that, that's right i mean the the narrative that they tried to play out was that there was always this battle against privilege and so on um so tolkien he was underprivileged he was taken in as a ward of the catholic church after he became an orphan and so on uh, mm. They were pushing that narrative. He went to Oxford and so on, and uh, he was seen as someone lower, uh, you know. Of oh, class, all the usual. Uh, Did they have some uh, snotty people bullying him? Yeah, and that, that's oh, right. In the, oh, in, in the beginning, you see the by the numbers. Yeah, stands uh, up for himself and so on, and becomes the heroic uh, music. That, yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, a girl twinkles at him as he's feeling down, and oh, you know, yeah. that picks him. Oh, fucking hell! I could write this. Yeah. <laughs> I could write this while we're talking. <laughs> that, that's right. You know, it's, it's written on the back of a cornflake packet, really. You know, um, but uh, the, I mean, the, it doesn't fall into the worst cliches, if you like, because you find out that the this uh, guy who's privileged, you know, one of his friends, who talking about that the headmaster's only interested in him, he's not interested in Tolkien, Tolkien mistakes it for him talking as though he's from a lower class background and so on, and he's not, it's, it's basically his father, that's why he's uh, only interested in him. Um, so there's there's some mitigating stuff, but it's not enough really. The, the whole narrative is really this sort of uh, fight against class privilege and so on as a but whole. Maybe somebody just looking for some interest interesting ideas for cinematic stuff it sounds like the flashback elements and the fantasy bleeding into what's otherwise a, almost a documentary effort that's a, that's a really interesting touch i'm not sure i've seen much of that done hmm. so that'd yeah. be worth uh, seeing just just for that to see how that was done yeah yeah that's um so i i, I would recommend it i would recommend watching it free if you can <laughs> uh, so, uh, just, leaning just... over the, somebody's shoulder while they've got their purchase DVD yeah <laughs> that's, that's, that's right so yeah I, I can recommend it in parts I, I think there's some interesting things in it but mm, mm -hmm. overall, overall it's uh, found wanting really and I think that that's about enough of it, really. I don't know if you've seen anything more interesting of late. Well, just touching back on The Lord of the Rings, here's a thought for everybody, is do we think that in 50 years' time they'll be doing one of George R.R. R. Martin, just like this? <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> just sat there eating burgers and so on. <laughs> that's it, sat there, being fat, complaining to girls on the internet that they don't like Samwell, Tarly. <laughs> 
<laughs> his, his Gary Stu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he manages to get himself an iceberg, doesn't he, Samuel Tarly, strangely. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, yeah. Um, so uh, that that was one film that that I saw. Um, I, I saw that Avengers End Game. Uh, any point, good? Must point out that I don't pay for any of these. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he's got a friend that works at a cinema. You see, that just you know he owns the cinema and he gets comp seats. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's right. Anyway, he says otherwise he's a liar. <laughs> 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 um, uh, Avengers Endgame. It's the worst thing you can possibly imagine. Oh, yeah. It it is literally every SJW cliche you can. Despite think it, of. it would be yeah. turned up to eleven. Yeah, that's right. It really yeah. is. So you get the ending where you have an old Captain America because he goes in time so he can age uh, with that sweetheart that he wanted to be with. Uh, you you get him giving the shield to the Black Panther. Of so, course. you know, aging white population handing over America to the young, dynamic <laughs> black. Hey, dear. Oh, it's so, it was so <laughs> fucking obvious. Uh, it's not even very subtle these days, are they? No, that's, that's right. And you have this uh, girl power scene when there's all the female... Uh, superheroes together uh, <laughs> just after they kicked a man in the testicles of course because you know girl power and all that um, of course yeah and uh, you know and there's six of them six <laughs> that number again oh. on the screen oh dear it's all a coincidence oh, all a coincidence yes <laughs> And so I think that that's about as uh, much as I'd like to say about Avengers, except that there there is now a flood, an absolute flood of superhero films. Yeah, yeah. I noticed there's, there's another X-Men out with that Sophie Turner, who people probably remember from Game of Thrones. Don't think, think she was that great an actress, but fair enough. She's obviously the, the hot topic because of that series. Yeah, that's right, and it's just a rehash of uh, a previous X Men film, isn't it? Uh, was it X Men Apocalypse, if I remember rightly? Was it? Yeah, it's just redone, same sort of thing. Yeah, with and not that long ago. This is the trouble. It's not that long ago, and exactly the same franchise. So when you recycle, it's the same audience you're recycling it to very recently. So that you'll, you'll notice it straight away. Yeah, which is just what they did with uh, Spider Man, and that was shameless, that one in particular. Yeah, <laughs> reboot, reboot, reboot the same bloody film. I know it's it's ridiculous. They did it with the, the Fantastic Four as well. Although the the Fantastic Four, the new one, didn't take off at all. Mm. It's so, one thing to do it when you know maybe ten years, twenty years, thirty years. You know, you hope a good long time. But but it's now getting to the point where they're rebooting five years. You know, it's it's almost non-stop. Yeah, and it says to me that they're running out of ideas. Uh, yeah. Well, that they've run out of ideas. And, and even the reboots, that the, even the reboots with the fans are, are just sinking like a stone. Like that Aladdin one, folks thought was, folk were up in arms with the, <laughs> the trailer alone. Yeah, uh, but people are still watching them. It would appear because that Avengers Endgame, that's now the second biggest grossing film of all time. Mm. But uh, you can't two, forget the... two two point eight billion. Uh, I think it's grossed, if I remember rightly. You can't forget the power of the media and the momentum they still have. You know, people will w want to go to the cinema. That That's the experience they want, going to the cinema. That happens to be on. They look at the rest and think, oh, I don't fancy them. This should be, you know, some explosions in entertainment, and they go to that. Hmm. And I think that's basically how it works. It's the well-advertised one that promises uh, spectacular vision. Don't mean that in an artistic sense, but I mean as in big explosions and CGI. Yeah, at the, at the same time, of course, they're imbibing incredible amounts of propaganda. And mm. Well, this is uh, yeah, this is a trouble where they're completely unaware of that, and you need folk like us to explain it. Don't mean that in a patronised sense, but I just mean in the sense that very few are saying that there is such a thing as propaganda in, in cinema. 
Well, yeah, and I mean, even some of the more edgy uh, webs, uh, not websites, but podcasts uh, on YouTube and so on have copped out, uh, like I used to love Red Letter Media, but they've completely copped out. Mm. And Turning a blind eye. Yeah, that's right. They've started turning a blind eye to things. And mm. finding narratives that are... Uh, avoid certain questions shall we say occasionally they'll throw something in there just to keep people interested but it's not enough really because you you mm. you have to address the propaganda because it's just so in your face now yeah it's not even subtle i mean you could go back to stuff decades ago and you've got you can dig it out and say ah oh, look you know if you look at it this way that <laughs> it's it, it, i mean you, they may as well just have a text scroll manifesto going for the, for an hour yeah well, the thing is that propaganda, it was always there, but it was done in a far more subtle and sophisticated way. Whereas mm. now, it is quite obvious that the people in Jollywood think that the audience is so dumbed down and so broken down and such idiots that they can throw in as much as they like. And and they're, and they're correct. And there's more and more percentage of it is propaganda and less and less is artistry and cinema this is the trouble as well you know it is heading towards just being basically a big advert for their views it, it is uh, absolutely and superhero films seem to be the worst for it mm. I, I mean there, there are already a absolute mass an absolute mass of superhero films planned uh, that, that are coming up so, well, this is what happens. As soon as one person has any success, you get the thousands of others that they've got to jump on board. I, I hate that trend in TV and cinema, where as soon as there's one success, you've got to have a million imitators. Wouldn't it be nice for them to keep trying different new ideas and get a success that way, rather than make us endure you know, 10 years of superhero films till we're absolutely sick of it? And then someone comes up with a new idea, and then you get 10 years of that until you're absolutely sick of it. Yeah. The the interesting thing with all these superhero films as well is that they all have extremely high reviews. Uh, mm. You know, they're, they're there's all quite a fandom up in for the superhero. 70s and beyond. Uh, yeah, there's on, quite a fandom for, Yeah, there's quite a, a very active fandom for superhero stuff, you know, into the comics. The, the comics themselves aren't doing great in sales, but they've got a huge... Uh, fan base and fandom for them and it stretches to quite uh, old ages to you're very young now so th they all go online and sort of vote things up anything that panders to their interest uh I, th I think as well though it's all to do with that critics now shill for the big film companies oh i mean that aspect of it hmm. uh, it's, it's, it happens all the time if you're t not talking about user you know this uh ordinary mind reviews if you're talking about the critics <laughs> i hardly pay attention now because you know it's it's just a big game because you find out there's a whole bunch of these websites people have provided ample evidence that they turn out to be owned by tv production companies or their parent companies and so on so they're actually a lot of these review sites turn out to be by business and corporate links tied up you think well how can you review things independently if you get a, the same paymaster yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not uh, even touching on the the cultural and political aspects that they all want to push forward, regardless of money. Just because that's you know their world and they want to push that, so they'll give a, a nod to certain films and <laughs> downgrade others. Uh, absolutely right. But we saw, of course, the discrepancy between what the general public thought and what the critics thought when it came to the last Star Wars film. Mm. Uh, the 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 last of the trilogy i mean you know the um, episode eight uh and of course there was a huge discrepancy between what the uh, critics thought and they all boosted it up and what mm. the general public thought um, and what did they do they got all, all these uh, celebrities and critics got outraged and had to tell everybody that they were bigots or it was this that and the other and that's the only reason somebody can't like something is because they're an evil bad man that's right and really i mean even if uh, you're not 
bothered about the propaganda aspects in it and couldn't care one way or the other. You see, I always look at films as films as well as the propaganda and so on. So I'll, I'll, I'll say if something's particularly well done or it's not, just to, in terms of technique and so on. Mm. And it was a bad film as a film and there's no doubt about that you can take it apart we've taken it apart actually uh why it's a bad film because mm. the whole thing doesn't make sense um but uh, superhero films that are upcoming uh include uh, the eternals i think that that's just about to come out oh um the the one in the i think it's just been released hasn't it into the cinemas is the latest spider-man film yep that's right the far from home that's right yeah there's one coming up called Shang Chi, uh, which is going to have the first Asian superhero on cinema. So is it actually a, is it made over there? Or is this a Hollywood production? It's um, it's written by a Chinese American called uh, David Callahan, but I think that well, I mean, it's, it's, it's Marvel Studios basically who's uh. instituting this, but there's. I mean, there are two things going on there. One is the commitment to multiculturalism and diversity and so on. But mm. equally on a business level, they're looking at a Chinese market. Yeah, which is causing them all sorts of problems trying to pander to their politics and culture and the culture and politics that's been formed in America, let's say. Yeah, that's right. Uh, apparently, um, Chloe Zhao uh, is directing the film and she's... Uh, uh, I think she's Chinese American, if I remember rightly, as well. The so. only thing is, that there's a very big, active Asian cinema in you know film production already. If they wanted to enjoy Asian cinema, why don't they go and see something that's authentically native to there, and then well, they could have something that's you know that they'd probably find something to enjoy because there's endless films made over there. But most of them, of course, aren't released uh, over here. But in the kind of the western sphere but if somebody has an interest in asian cinema they could go out and enjoy that anytime they like and it'll probably be 10 times better than anything hollywood puts out absolutely right yeah um i, I, I don't know why the any chinese person would want to watch this shit to be quite honest yeah uh, i would want to watch one of my own ethnic films produced by my people for my people simple as that and likewise, from my point of view, if I wanted to enjoy some Chinese cinema, I would want it to be something from there completely Chinese. And obviously, I'll need subtitles, but I'll I'll enjoy it because it's it's an authentic experience. Yeah, that's right. We had a bit of a super villain film, a super villain origins film called Bright ah, I think it, yeah, Brightburn. I don't know if you saw anything of that. I've seen the trailer for that. <laughs> it's basically Superman. But it didn't go well. <laughs> that, that's <laughs> when, right, yeah. Because when I first when I was watching the trailer, uh, I saw it in the cinema. The trailer. And when I was watching it, I thought, "Is this another Superman film?" And then you start to see it go wrong and wrong. And you go, "Ah, I can see the twist." Quite a clever idea. Yeah, um, I'm 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 going to give it a bit of a nod to say that okay, that was an interesting idea. It's a bit different from the usual superhero fare to make it mm. into a horror film. Yeah, but I think actually, in some ways, it was a critique of superhero films because now we've got to such a level of power. Have you noticed how the powers are escalating of these superheroes? But as you say, at least, very least, that we know Superman was around for, from an early age, and it was a bit he was given absurd levels of power. Yeah, and and Marvel have escalated their power levels for superhero uh, superheroes and supervillains as well because they want to probably beat each other's spectacular effects that's right yeah so we've got now this captain marvel who of course is the most powerful character and, and it's woman of course and where are they going to go from that well where they're going is the eternals which are these like uh, titans if you like from greek mythology almost uh, so to to mm. that level of you know cosmic energy type beings and everything so that's where they're going next it's, it's just getting ridiculous uh quite frankly going to find it very hard to actually write stories 
about that kind of character you know, when you get to that level of power and being because it's going to be so out of touch from anything a human can connect to. Yeah. It's... I mean, it's, like, it's the difference between, when you look at the sort of pagan gods in Europe's history. The, the stories were always written in a way a person could connect to. Well, if you just make it these ultra super beings that are so alien to you, it's just going to mean nothing. Yeah. And it gets to a point where it becomes uh, where things are elevated so much to such a long period of time that that level of elevation becomes dull. It's, mm. it, it's the same as if you read John Milton's Paradise Lost, for example, where he's describing heaven and hell and all this lot, and so it's got to be in the most superlative terms. He's got to kind of keep it going. And then when uh, when he gets to the tree, you know, the, to, to, to this uh, tree that uh, Adam and Eve, of course, they're not allowed to uh, eat from it and everything, how do you highlight it? So what he does is the reverse. He makes it so normal, so ordinary, to, 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 to sort of make it stand out because everything has <laughs> been so superlative. And, and yeah. this, is the, this is the problem that Marvel in particular, uh, well, I suppose even DC are having it as well with Superman, in that what do you do when you've he reached such a level of the superlative that you can't go any further? Well, yeah, well, that was the trouble, of course, even with Superman in the films, was trying to come up with a challenge for him. Yeah. You've got somebody that's almost perfect emotionally and character-wise, perfect physically, <laughs> far beyond... You know any human weapon, so they had to kind of come up with some quite fantastical schemes. He obviously had the the kryptonite flaw, but how many times can you wheel that out yeah, without it, it becoming it, a bit cliched? Here's another kryptonite based weapon. <laughs> exactly, but at least with the old Superman films, so Superman One and Superman Two, we're talking about here yeah, uh, from 1970s early 80s. At least it had a good plot. And mm. that's something that actually saved the film. I thought that they were interesting films in terms of plot, in terms of characterization and so on. Uh, you could actually be interested in the character and plot of the films. But here, they have no attention to any of that. It's just basically a special effects extravaganza. And this is the problem with it, that if you're just relying on that, and you've got no plot, really, because the plot is basically so formulaic, it's unbelievable, with a bit <laughs> of SJW propaganda thrown in. Uh, eventually, you're going to have a problem of where do you go? Where do you go from there? They're sort of boxing themselves in with this. Yeah. Because uh, at, at the moment, it's the formula of you've got a bad guy... Uh, you've got to find a way to beat the bad guy. It involves collecting some shit to beat the bad guy <laughs> That's with. That's right. Yeah. Collect the ten MacGuffins or whatever you need. Yeah. That's... That is very formulaic. But, of course, it, a lot of these formulas, you see the same thing uh, people complain about even now with the computer games, the console games, and so on. It's the same bloody formulas that turn up with them all. And I think there's been quite an unhealthy influence back and forth with these media yeah, yeah, you're ab absolutely right. Because, of course, you have to sell a computer game off the back of a film. And you have to sell a film off the back of a computer game. Mm. And, so, and, and then there's all the other merchandising and shit as well that goes with it. So, unfortunately, that is very bad for the art of filmmaking. And we looked back at uh, the old art of filmmaking from uh, D.W. Griffith, of course, in one of our previous podcasts. And, and you see the difference. You see the difference in artistry and technique and loving care that's taken over a film. You can be sure before he started that he wasn't thinking about what will go in a lunchbox or what action figures they make. <laughs> no, e exactly. And, and in fact, it bankrupted him. <laughs> <laughs> um, his uh, commitment to artistry. Uh, ah, it's, it's Brightburn's the same director as Gardens of the Galaxy. Yeah. Mm. It's so, interesting he would make a critique of superhero films. <laughs> that, that, that's right. But it's 
a film that to me it explores the helplessness of ordinary people in relation to these sort of figures mm -hmm. and I, I think that one of the reasons for the superhero film, I, I think that you've mentioned it before James uh, that people are made to feel helpless in the audience you know instead of identifying with these uh, these superheroes and so on because uh, the difference between a superhero and, and a normal hero is of course that you can actually attain the ability of a hero through effort yeah. whereas that's a super it. superhero I, you can't yeah a, a hero in like a war film or something that's something a lot of people could imagine doing in some situation you know, the ordinary person could run into the burning building and hopefully save the kid save the granny whatever it is yeah but I can't fly through the air and shoot laser beams out of my eyes, no matter how much I pretend or wish. Yeah. So what uh, they've done with Brightburn is is the obvious, basically. Uh, so, well, what if he's evil and you're all helpless? That's very, uh, very Machiavellian in 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 a way, because the the whole point of going to the cinema is that you have some kind of catharsis, just as you used to do in the Greek theatre, which is where this word comes from that there is mm. catharsis at the end. But there's no catharsis in these sorts of films. Although they've established that with the modern horror genre that this now is acceptable. You can just have a kind of very grim, hard film with no happy end. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, which is sort of the typical modern horror ending where, you know, that there Especially is Especially no... the torture porn type stuff. Yeah, that, that's which, right. Uh, Horrible. In a, in a way, Brightburn borders on that. A bit um, too sadistic. Yeah, and it sort of has this idea that you're helpless and there's nothing you can do. And I I think that that's something that the elites are trying to push, actually. Well, you've got somebody here in a film where they're saying, "Look, people with power, the ordinary people, people are useless against this person with power." Hmm. That's right. Although. It, obviously, we, we can't know how the end. There could be a, a oh look, a twist, an escape, or something. You know. That's right. So you, the elites who create all these films, of course, and a lot of them are of a certain ethnicity. They're always pushing this idea that we are far more powerful than you, and you can do nothing. You better hope that we're fucking good. <laughs> and that's it. Yeah, uh, your your only chance is just to hope that. The, the, the super people dominate you will put up with you. Yeah, and, and regard you as pets or something. Mm. Rather but, than maybe beating and control yourself. That's right. And it's it's all a confidence trick in a way. Because mm. these people who claim to have power, it's only social power really. It's all in the mind. Yeah, there's no such thing actually as superheroes or super no. villains. No, that's right. So, one to be aware of. In the, the, there are, as well, which I'm glad to see, there are things uh, happening outside of Hollywood. There are independent films being made. Mm. Uh, one such one is a channel called Dust, which is on YouTube. Yeah, I've seen that. It's quite interesting. Yeah. They've really uh, quite an output from it, too. Ab absolutely, yeah. So they, they've started with short narratives uh, science fiction this is and it's of the sort of old liberal type of science fiction so there's no explicit sjw stuff in it i've not found any at any rate i don't know about you uh, i've not it's put out quite a bit of content so i've not actually kept track of all of it so there could have been things that i've not seen yes it's the same here but of the stuff that i've seen it's not it's not SJW stuff anyway. It's liberal, mm. don't get me wrong, but it's it's not as extreme as the shit they're churning out in Hollywood. More uh, palatable. It's more palatable, that's right. But they're not our guys, but what's interesting is that it shows you what is possible. Yeah. And that's important. Just Just knowing something's actually possible makes a big difference. Yeah. And and these they they really are they they're of the quality of Hollywood. Yeah, that's that's any time you look at the this their stuff, it is impressive. They've obviously been clever about limiting the length of it, the scope of it, 
so that they've got a very high quality for that duration. They've not got, they've not played to their weakness, they've played to their strengths. Well, apparently now they've, they've started with longer films. I haven't watched any of them yet, but they've started with longer films. But the shorts, they're, they're really good. And of course, that's how things started in cinema anyway. They, they they started with one reelers, then they got on to two reelers. This is going back, you know, turn of the century, uh, turn of the 20th century. They started with the one reel, then, then they went on to two reelers, and then all of a sudden they got five reelers, and then, of course, D.W. Griffiths, he, he thought, well, you know, I'm going to have this huge epic, uh, which uh, became Birth of a Nation. That's worse uh, than the, the race with the razor blades, isn't it, with Gillette? Five blades in one razor. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> but uh, this this is how you start, yeah, it, because with the democratization of technology, of course, we we can all do it. Perhaps not to the level of dust, uh, you, you know, who make absolutely brilliant effects uh, on the sci-fi little shorts that they do. Well, oh, the, the special effects they're producing are better than TV shows that would cost a million pound an episode not long ago. I mean, they're making stuff that's, as you say, it's of a level of Hollywood or multi-million TV series. Yeah, you, you could put uh, them easily against the the new Star Trek series, for example. Yeah, and that cost, I think somebody said it cost several million episodes, something like tens of million. Yeah, so you have to wonder where all that money goes to, actually. Somebody's uh, enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. I, I, th I think that uh, there are lots of shenanigans going on and people are overcharging and everything. But it just shows you that these people are doing it on a budget and that that's possible. Yeah, um, just proving something's possible is a tremendous difference. Yeah. Uh, we can all talk and speculate, but when somebody goes out and do it, does it? You've now got irrefutable proof. Hmm. Absolutely. Now... Um, you know a, a guy who, who's also making short films as well, don't you? You've come across a channel. Oh, yeah. It was one. It was mentioned on uh, Red Ice as well, that one. And Michael Kingsbury, who of Celtic Films, he seems to be focusing mostly on the uh, Soviet suffering, the gulags and things. He did a film quite recently, Gulag Magadan. And he's got some family history and so have some of the actors in the Soviet system. It's done in a tremendously low budget, and for the best explanation of it, you can actually go to his YouTube channel. If you search for his name, Michael Kingsbury, you'll get his YouTube channel come up, and you'll know it's his with it, because it's been there for some years. He's also got a website, Celtic-Films, and uh, that that is done on budgets that a few mates could chip together, really, or one person really determined could do. It's things like five thousand dollar budgets is what he's working with tremendously uh, cheap especially seeing he has to build sets like the, the holding pens for the prisoners and so on and he'll go in he goes into depth very interesting with a director commentary he's just put up for free on youtube he's currently got 65 subscribers which is absolutely mind-boggling to me that you've got people who i mean no offense to them it's their spare time do what they like but talk about Game of Thrones, what they thought the latest episode, especially on the right. <laughs> and <laughs> you've got this guy who's making actual films and he has been around for a while doing various efforts of his own. Maybe it's not as big an output as he'd like, but obviously he's got to pay for things, so he's, he must have a job or have to try and raise funds here and there. So it's not a tremendous output, because he does see himself, he has to do build his own sets, he has to move the sets about, he has to do his own makeup. He has to do costume work for certain things, props. That is a, a tremendous effort to, in one film if you've not even got somebody to you know, give you that kind of time and effort. But the fact that somebody's determined to do it and can prove he can do it by producing something at the end of it is very impressive. It's well worth going to his, in his, his uh, YouTube channel and watching his commentary just so you can listen to the kind of effort and process that making a very low budget indie film almost one man effort is he does also credit various people and the actors and others that might have helped him with certain things or uh, brought their own thing to the table like some of the actors had their history with 
the Soviet Union, so they were particularly interested in exposing some of the the cruelties and hardships of it and how some of the politics of it worked. That's uh, really good. So we'll uh, link to that below so that you can go to it directly. But I think that the figures, the viewing figures, have obviously been manipulated because YouTube are notorious for it. Certainly, Well, certainly he won't be getting recommended in anybody's feed. I mean, I'm looking at his, look at his uh, YouTube. He's got stuff going back five years where he's done short films from 2014 and yet, <laughs> I, 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 know, can't, I can't believe that they've only got 65 views. That, that's 65 a, subscribers. Uh, 65 subscribers, sorry. I, I don't believe those figures for an instant. I think that YouTube has, again, been guilty of manipulating figures. It, and there'll, be, there'll no doubt be unsubscribing people accidentally with those glitches that happen. And they'll be never recommended any time it might come up in the algorithm because somebody's clicking on a bunch of cinema and films maybe about the Gulag. It's never going to suggest his stuff. Yeah, they they ch- they stole a chunk of mine yesterday again. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. And and then I got a few subscribers back again. It's it's, it's a game, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's a back and forth game. So I suppose. In some ways, <laughs> you kind of get used to it, don't you? <laughs> it is, yeah. But you think, well, you know, whatever. I, I, I'm kind of aware that's the game going on. If they just want to do that, like, ah, you know. <laughs> that's <laughs> it's like somebody right. calling your name. You don't really bother. If somebody calls your name, you know, in a comment, you think, well, fair enough. Yeah, I'm not going to make a video if I get to a thousand. I go, ooh, magic. 1,000 subscribers or something like that, <laughs> you know. Uh, With a nice graph, I, I, maybe? I, I, yeah, I, I couldn't imagine anybody being like that, you know. To... No, you'd have to be very shallow and egotistical. Right, yeah, Nothing going on in your life but your YouTube to do that. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So we, we're just going to uh, keep producing stuff regardless of how many subscribers are shown on our YouTube account, so... You might as well be <laughs> honest, YouTube. Fuck you. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, uh, yeah, if there's nothing more to add, uh, because I, I think that that's, uh, that might be a good place to leave it, actually, with this uh, Michael Kingsbury. Ben, I say we, we don't know a lot about him, but he's uh, was, he'd, he'd been mentioned, and I think it's a shame that if he is genuine and he's making good stuff, it's a shame to think he's sort of languishing with very little support, can't get grants or funding for his artistic efforts, and he has already produced something, so people should be looking at it to examine it, criticise it, break it down, praise it, whatever they like. Anybody out there, whatever your views, go and examine this this uh, production to see what you think of it. Talk yeah, about it. That's right, and, and perhaps get behind him for the next one that he wants to make. Especially as he's saying, even things like, for instance, he's talking about the tremendous effort it took him to do the makeup for people. Because if you've got 10 actors, you've got to spend maybe 15 minutes doing actors. Well, there you go. There's 150 minutes wasted. It's snowing. People are having to get there themselves in their own car. And that spread. And if you've got a very limited time with film, especially as he can't afford the lights, He's got to use natural light, so he's got a very limited time to film at the right time. So even if you were a woman with makeup skills, if you said, I'll help you with the next film, he'd probably be over the moon. He'd yeah. be overjoyed, probably, because that's you saving him. One person just saying, I'll give you just my time. And he'd probably be over the moon with that. Yeah. So and... do, you know, don't think that you can't contribute. He's talking about the great effort he had to do to build things like sets. Now the sets he's building are things like the bunk beds, which are just wooden things nailed together, dirtying up rags and clothes, you know, to make it look, and painting it to make it look. These are things that don't require tremendous skills or artistic efforts, but they do require time. That's right. So, you know, if you can help him on the set to get things built and per- perhaps help out with a bit of money by going down to the DIY shop and getting some of the bits of wood and stuff like that, or a mattress for the bunk beds that he's used as props. Yeah. Every little helps instead of giving yeah. it to people who don't do anything. Yeah. If somebody's just going to... If you give... I mean, even for us, I mean, we don't ask for anything, but if somebody gives us money and we've not got anything to do, what do we end up doing? Like anybody would, you just spend it or put it away, you're not going to do anything with it immediately, and probably not the long road, unless you've got something in mind, unless you're up front 
and what they're going to spend the money on, you have to just assume it's going to get wasted on entertainment. Yeah. Well, this man has a clear struggle to do something, a clear end goal. I mean, he's sacrificing, obviously, time and his own money to do this, so he must have a, quite a passion to do it. And there's other people like him out there doing these things. So have an idea who you're going to support with time or money, what they're going to do with it. Because there's no point you taking money from your life, money that could go to raising your family or have, making a family, which is what we want anyway, Hmm. And just giving it to somebody who's going to spend it in what beer, uh, computer games, music, you know, entertainment. Well, that's a waste of time, isn't it? You'd be as well putting it towards your own family then. But if you can say, well, I'll sacrifice not having beers this week or not going to go to the cinema this week because then I can put that ten pound or whatever you'd have spent on that uh, bit of fancy, bit of luxury towards something of actual worth and creation that will last, like for instance, a cinematic production or a great piece of music, whatever, then at least you've contributed to something great that was well worth sacrificing some minor pleasure. Absolutely right. And I can't add anything to that. So I shall bring this podcast to a close. It's a great mm. message to end things on. Uh, so uh, thanks very much, James, for participating as usual. And enjoyed it. Yeah. And uh, we'll certainly do more of these now showings uh, whenever... Uh, there are only a couple of us here, so uh, you and Neil will be doing some, I would imagine. And mm. I'll, I'll do some with Neil's when you can't make it. So, yeah, um, yeah it's a nice little format anyway. And uh, it uh, it's good to look at what's happening, I think, uh, uh, what's going on in the cinema world at the moment. Yeah, so. there's so many of these things that it's, it's good to cover it, especially if you're not doing it in a full review format. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, yeah, the the last message then, just to reiterate, um, look into Michael Kingsbury. Is it Kingsbury or Kingsbury? Kingsbury with an S. Sorry, Michael Mike. Kingsbury, of and he's is uh, Celtic Dash Films dot com. If you Google his name, it will come up, and it should come up his uh, name for his channel on YouTube. At least it will currently. If it gets purged, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then uh, goodbye from me, folks. Goodbye from me. And remember to subscribe and share. <laughs> Bye.